First Baptist Church as well. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been to church, here anyway. And uh, two weeks ago, I took a week off, took a Sunday off, and uh, I knew that was going to happen, and yet I was in town, so I went to a church in town. But I have to tell you how tempted I was to sleep in and not go to any church. Is it okay to say that? We did. Didn't we? Good. Well, that was last week. Oh. Yeah, two weeks ago. Well, last week I did go to church, yeah. But I had to because the staff was with me, so we had to. <laughs> but I mean, I'm talking two weeks ago. I didn't have to go to church, but uh, I just felt a little of what you feel like every now and then. I know some of you, some of you don't, but uh, I have to tell you, I went to a great little church here in town, and uh, it was exciting. Last week with the staff, uh, we went to a very, very, in fact, the largest church in this uh, region, and uh, that was exciting too. But every every Sunday when I'm not here I miss you people um, my friends my um, mentors in some cases and uh, I, I just love First Baptist Church I hope you do too I miss it when I'm not here um, so I did want to uh, start with prayer and I forgot so let's bow for a word of prayer Father you're a great God we just sang to you we sang to you how much we appreciate your role in our lives and the fact that uh, we forget that. I thank you, Lord, that we can sing new songs. And I, I pray that we can, we can um, wake up every day and be reminded of our relationship with you. And just what, how amazing it is that the God of the universe did not create and then leave. That you were engaged. That, that, that not only did you send your son, Jesus Christ, he lived here on this earth and died for each one of us, but now... Today, Lord, you pray for us. You sit at the right hand of the Father. You intercede for us. You're our advocate. You're our shepherd. You, you, are, you, you sent your spirit to live in our lives. And because of all that, because we believe that's true, we ask right now that you would guide us in these next moments as we look at your word, that you would instruct us, that you would uh, move us in the direction you want us to go. We resist that so naturally, it seems, and um, stray from you. But I pray, God, that your spirit would work in our hearts. Teach us something new today. Remind us of what we have forgotten. Uh, but at the end of this time together, I pray that we will have met with you. Would you just take a moment of silent prayer and ask that of God? That at the, when you leave this place, this room, that uh, you're willing and you're, you're, you're ready for God to speak and, and turn something in your life. Adjust something and, uh, and make you more like his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that your word says that you refresh our souls when we come to you. Pray you do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I begin the message, I do want to ask you to take the notes out of your bulletin, and on the back of your bulletin, I want you to take a look at this. 
On the back of your bulletin, we have a, something called the Assessment Implementation Team, and we have been working on our purpose statement, on our vision, and we've come up with a, quite a long document in different areas of ministry. But what we want to do is to have your input on the short version of our vision statement. And so we have three options here. I want you to, to uh, weigh in on this on your connection card. The first one, if you see under vision statements, ordinary people radically transformed by God to live extraordinary lives by following Jesus. Number two, leading ordinary people to a radical life change through a growing relationship with Jesus. And thirdly, ordinary people transformed to live extra ordinary lives by following our pastor's example. <laughs> so I know you want to vote for number three, but um, we're looking for uh, some help. We've, both of these uh, first two seem to capture uh, what it is that our church uh, should be all about. Well, take your notes out. Uh, we're at the tail end of a series this summer on tough questions. And this question today is one of the toughest. Why is it that sometimes God seems distant, distant or silent or not answering our prayers, not right there? The Bible seems to be full of examples of people who were in love with Jesus, who had a personal relationship with him, um, where they loved God and they saw tremendous miracles in their lives, why doesn't that happen more to me? And why do I go through these periods of dry, desert-like existence spiritually? That's a tough question. I know that many of you, probably all of you, have this experience. You need some customer service. And so you call the company. Maybe you bought something and it's broken. Maybe you bought a computer and you can't figure out how, but you call customer service and you get a recording, of course. Nobody answers the phone anymore. So you get this recording and it gives you several options, maybe five, seven options. And you're listening to all the options and you realize none of them are what you want. And so you're thinking to yourself, okay, they didn't really think of me, but I really like to talk to a live person. And so you listen to that message a couple times, finally figure out, maybe just hit zero or whatever, but you finally get a live person on the other line, the other end of the line, and that person speaks with an accent you can't understand. And so they can't understand you, you can't understand them, and finally this person gets the idea that you ought to be talking to their supervisor or some other department, so uh, please wait and I'll, I'll transfer you. What happens? You get cut off. After 20 minutes of trying to find the right person, now you have to start over and oftentimes you just give up. Sometimes we feel like that with God. We read the Bible, we know some stuff about Him, we know that we ought to pray and He ought to answer. Even if it's a no, any word is better than no word. But sometimes it just feels like a machine. And God is not present. He's not answering. He's not listening. He's not acting on our behalf. What do you do when you feel like God has put you on hold? And you've been on hold for a while. Well, my short answer is, I don't know. If you're in ministry for any length of time, you've been a Christian for any length of time, or if you're a parent and you get the why question a lot, you need to get friendly with these three words. I don't know. Because God doesn't tell us everything when it comes to answering the why question. But of course, I'm a preacher, so I'm going to try. But I want to start with that. I should tell you, too, that the Bible is full of examples of people who felt exactly like you feel. The Bible is full of heroes, spiritual heroes, who felt alone, who felt like God deserted them, or like God took a vacation from them. None more vivid than a man named David in the Old Testament. Now about half of the Psalms that we have in the, in the collection of Psalms in your Bible were written by David. 
A man, God says, is a man after my own heart. His heart looks like mine. His passions look like my passions. His values are like my values. Now, David wasn't perfect by any stretch, but the, in his heart, he had this personal drive, this connection with God Almighty. And from boyhood, he sat there on the hills as he shepherded sheep and, and drew uh, connections between God, the universe, and, and God's word. David knew God. And I want to begin this message with a few of his words, beginning with Psalm 10. You see it there in your notes from the message. It says, God, are you avoiding me? Where are you when I need you? Psalm 13, 1. How much longer, Lord, will you forget about me? Will it be forever? How long will you hide? How long must I con be confused and miserable all day? How long will my enemies, enemies keep beating me up? Now just to give you a little biblical history here, you remember David and Goliath, right? The story in the Bible. David, this 17-year-old or whatever, young man, uh, kills Goliath with a slingshot, and Goliath is 9 feet 6 inches tall, and of course God uses that to not only win a, a, a particular victory, but to set up David as the next leader of Israel. Samuel, the prophet, had already anointed David. He'd been filled with the Spirit, which is what gave him the gumption, the energy, the, 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 the desire, and the courage to uh, come up against Goliath. And people made songs up about David and his leadership because he was, he was a great man, as young as he was. But you know that God called him to be the king, but it was many, many years before he actually sat on the throne. What happened in the meantime? What happened between his anointing and, sl and slain Goliath and the time he sat on the throne? Tell me. He was on the run. He lived in caves. Saul became jealous of his predecessor and tried to kill him. Not once, but many times. He sent out armies against him. David was running for his life, and he wrote many of these psalms that we have. In fact, you see a list of several of them. Not all of them were written by David, but these words that we've read, uh, many of them came when David was like, What is up with God? Where are you? I was so in love with you as I sat by myself watching those sheep, and now I'm sitting in this cave on the run what is going on Psalm 22 verse 1 from the pen of David my God my God why have you abandoned me does that sound familiar Jesus quoted David on the cross before he died why are you so far away when I groan for help every day I call to you my God but you do not answer every night you hear my voice but I find no relief let me read a couple of others. Psalm 69, Save me, O God, for the floodwaters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. I am in deep water, and, my flood, and the floods overwhelm me. I'm exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. Psalm 74, O God, why have you rejected us so long? We no longer see your miraculous signs. All the prophets are gone. No one can tell us when it will end. Psalm 88, but I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Is God in this sick game of hide and seek with us? What is going on? This is a man of God who is writing this. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm. It's halfway into your Bible, so just let it flop open in the middle. Most likely you'll be there in the book of Psalms. Now, I'm going to read many Psalms throughout this, this uh, message. So, you can, uh, I've used different translations and paraphrases, but you can uh, check these out. What I want you to see first, though, is that this is what is normal. This is not abnormal. This is not strange. It's not different. It's not unique to you. If you've walked with Jesus for any length of time, if you read my email, you have discovered that this is something that you have to go through. And, and you do. Sometimes for years go through these dry spells, this desert spell, spiritually speaking, where God seems distant, far away, and unconcerned with your plight, with your pain, with your suffering with your 